Start by washing your hands and donning PPE if appropriate. Introduce yourself to the patient, including your name and role. Next, confirm the patient's identity, for example, by asking them their name and date of birth. Once you've confirmed their identity, briefly explain what the examination will involve using non-technical language and gain consent to proceed. Before starting the formal examination, take a look around the bedside to assess for any items that might give you a clue that the patient may have cerebellar issues. This might include looking for walking aids since cerebellar disease can cause issues with balance. Start off the examination by assessing the patient's gait. Ask them to walk across the room, turn around and come back. Patients with cerebellar pathology may have unsteady and broad-based gait, commonly referred to as cerebellar ataxia. You should try to ensure that you see the patient turning, because often in cerebellar disease, turning around is challenging. If you suspect a cerebellar problem, try to make sure that you're positioned near to the patient in case they lose their balance. Next, if appropriate to do so, check tandem gait, which is referred to as heel-to-toe walking. Heel-to-toe walking can exacerbate underlying balance problems, making it easier to identify more subtle ataxia. It's particularly useful for identifying issues with the cerebellar vermis, which is located in the medial corticonucleosome of the cerebellum and is often affected in alcoholism. Whilst the patient is standing, you could also perform a Romberg test. This is a good screening test to distinguish cerebellar defects from sensory ataxia, i.e. loss of proprioceptive or vestibular function. To do this, ask the patient to stand up with the feet together. However, be ready to catch them in case they fall. If they seem reasonably steady, ask the patient to close their eyes. They can either hold their hands beside themselves or hold them across the body. Watch to see if the patient is able to stay steady or if they begin to wobble. In sensory ataxia, the patient is likely to lose balance. This is a positive Romberg's test. In cerebellar ataxia, the patient should be no more unsteady with their eyes closed than with their eyes open. Once you've assessed gait, assess the patient's speech. Ask the patient to say their name and address. If speech appears normal in this response, ask them to say the following phrases. British, Constitution and West Register Street. This may help to elicit any dysarthria, including scanning speech, which is also known as staccato speech. Patients with cerebellar disorders may present with enunciation of individual syllables. For example, the British Parliament becomes the British Parliament. Patients with cerebellar lesions may also have slurred speech. Once you've assessed speech, move on to assess the eyes. Ask the patient to follow your finger whilst you make an H shape roughly 40 centimeters in front of their eyes. Assess eye movements for evidence of nystagmus and impaired smooth pursuit. Nystagmus involves repetitive, involuntary oscillation of the eyes and can either be physiological or associated with cerebellar pathology. In a patient with a cerebellar lesion, you may notice fast phase nystagmus towards the side of the cerebellar lesion. There are other visual issues that may indicate a cerebellar problem. The first is known as dysmetric saccades. Hold a pen at 3 metres and then move it quickly, asking the patient to keep their head still and follow the pen with their eyes. The patient's eyes tracking the object should be quick and accurate. If the gaze overshoots the object, then quickly corrects back to the target, this is known as dysmetric saccades and could suggest a cerebellar lesion. The other abnormality that you might observe at this part of the test are jerky or saccadic movements of the eyes when tracking the objects instead of smooth movements. This is referred to as impaired smooth pursuit. Next move on to assess the upper limbs. The first test is the finger to nose test. Hold your finger at roughly arm's length away from the patient. Ask the patient to touch the tip of your finger with the tip of their finger. Then ask them to touch their own nose. They should repeat this movement. In a patient with a cerebellar lesion, they may demonstrate past pointing and a tremor. Past pointing, meaning their finger goes past the target, is known as dysmetria. A tremor can be particularly apparent at nearly full length extension, and this is why you should put your finger roughly an arm's length away from the patient. Next assess for rebound phenomenon. Ask the patient to hold their arms out straight in front of them with palms facing downwards and fingers pointing forwards. Explain to the patient that you're going to apply a downward force to their arms, but they should try keep their arms in this position. You should then push down and immediately remove resistance. In a normal response, the arms and fingers may move up a short distance when the downwards resistance is removed before moving back to the original starting position. 
In cerebellar dysfunction, when you press the arm downwards, it may swing past the original point several times before coming to a rest. You then should assess tone in the upper limb. You can assess tone at the shoulder, elbow and wrist on both sides. In patients with ipsilateral cerebellar lesions, you may detect hypotonia, i.e. reduced tone, but this is a very subtle clinical sign which is not always present and can be subjective, so don't place too much emphasis on this if you are unable to detect it. Next, assess for dysdiodocokinesia, which is the inability to perform rapid alternating movements and can again be a feature of ipsilateral cerebellar pathology. To perform this assessment, ask the patient to place one hand over the next and have them flip one hand back and forth as fast as possible. Observe the speed and fluidity of these rapid alternating movements. Patients with cerebellar ataxia may struggle to carry out this task with their movements appearing slow and irregular. You can then move on to assess the lower limbs. You could begin by assessing tone in the lower limbs across the hip, knee and ankle joints, looking again for hypotonia. However, this may not be necessary if upper limb tone has been assessed. You could assess for the knee jerk reflex which is again assessing the L3 L4 nerve roots. In cerebellar disease, reflexes can be described as pendular, meaning they are less brisk. However, like tone, this is subjective and reflexes can appear normal. You could also assess lower limb coordination by performing the heel shin test, which is the lower limb equivalent of the finger to nose test. To do this, ask the patient to put the heel of one foot onto the knee of their opposite leg, then run the heel down the shin in a straight line to the opposite ankle, lifting off the heel and repeating this movement. They should do this on both sides. An abnormal exam occurs when they're unable to keep their foot on the shin in a coordinated manner, which is known as dysmetria. Finish off the exam by thanking the patient for their time, ensuring they're comfortable and informing them that the examination has finished. If you're wearing PPE, you can dispose of it, finish by washing your hands, summarising your findings and documenting them. You could also suggest further assessments and investigations, for example a full neurological examination covering all cranial nerves as well as neuroimaging if this is indicated and a formal hearing assessment because certain pathologies can affect the cerebellum, for example an acoustic neuroma. Thanks for watching, I hope you found this useful. If you did please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment if you have any questions. I hope you learned something new and until next time, bye.